Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back, everybody. Here we are again with Stephen Campbell, our brain whisperer. Hello. And my partner, Hello. John Coleman. Hey, Steve. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Good to see you again. It's been um, a I, I, I don't like being gone for so long. But... <laughs> I was talking to someone about uh, habits, bad habits and good habits. And, yeah. and they were quitting smoking was what came up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I thought to myself, boy, this is perfect subject for the brain whisperer because habits really are all about our brain, aren't they? They really I mean, are. I, I'm really sure we are. can get, we can get physically addicted like my friend is to cigarettes or was, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's really, it starts up here, doesn't it? It starts up in your mind. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the physiology of habits, how they're developed physiologically. And that sounds scary, but it really isn't because I'm a really, really good teacher. So <laughs> picture in your mind the outline of a brain, okay? Let's use our daughter, Sarah, as an example. Sarah was raised in Rohnert Park. Rohnert Park is a little enclave about 60 miles north of San Francisco. Sarah, is so, Sarah knew nothing about a city. Rohnert Park is not a city. So Mary, who was an educator, also a principal, said to me when, Mary, when Sarah was about four years old, we need to teach Sarah about a city. So I said, okay, let's do that. So I'm an academic. So first of all, I read her a book. Here's how the brain works. Here's how the brain learns. Here's how habits are created. Okay. I read her a book. The brain recorded that book as a neural cluster, a teeny little cluster of neurons right under here, under the prefrontal cortex, under your forehead. So now imagine a little circle that says book. I read her another book. So now imagine another circle that says book. Then we took her to San Francisco. So now imagine another circle that says San Francisco. Then we took her to Oakland. So imagine another circle that says Oakland. Then we showed her cars, fire engines, parking places, buildings, skyscrapers. And the brain's got all of these little circles that represent a neural cluster in her brain. Those are developed during the day. Now, here's what happens when she goes to sleep. Here's what happens to all of us. When we go to sleep, our brain says, oh, good, wonderful. Now leave me alone. Leave me alone for the next eight hours. Because now what I need to do is I need to make sense out of all the stuff that you gave me during the day. And I could not do it during the day. Why? Because you gave me so much stuff I could possibly keep up what I was thinking, what I was feeling, what I was tasting, what I was hearing, what I was seeing. I couldn't keep up with all the stuff that you gave me. According to the National Science Foundation, around 85,000 thoughts per day. Don't ask me how they counted them, but that's what they estimate, okay? So now she's asleep. So now what the brain does is it begins looking at all the stuff that she learned, all those little circles, and it tries to find similarities. It tries to find relationships. So here's a book about a city. Here's a book about a city. They both have got people, lights, cars. Those should be connected. So here's what the brain does. The brain connects those two clusters of neurons with axons, dendrites, synaptic clefts, etc. That's where the neurons come in. Here's another cluster about the city and the city. So it connects that and then that. And now you're watching all of those little circles being connected. So imagine lines being drawn between the circles. What you're watching now, as you're watching the lines being drawn between the little circles, is you're watching Sarah learn. This is how our brain learns during the night. In fact, we now know our brain is more active when we're asleep than when we're awake. And over time, what the brain does is it creates a pattern of a city. And now Sarah will never forget what a city is. It's got people, lights, cars, etc. So when she goes to London, because she lives in Ireland now, or she goes to Dublin, cities don't freak her out because she knows what a city is. 
and the brain adds to those patterns. Now, how many patterns can the brain carry? Let's ask that a different way. How much can your brain learn and grow and change? Well, the patterns are based on the connections. The connections are based on the number of neurons that you have, blood, neuro, nerve cells. The latest study is about 83 billion. So wow. the human brain's got about 83 billion brain cells. Now that's big, but listen to this. Hold on to your seat. Each of those cells are connected to 10,000 other cells. Wow. That's not a multiple, that's a power. So mm. the number of connections which the brain can carry is 83 billion to the power of 10,000. That's 83 billion times 83 billion, 10,000 times. It's a number that, that mankind cannot even fathom. Dr. V. S. Ramachandran out of UC San Diego wrote in his book, A Guy, uh, Phantoms in the Brain, on page eight, that neuromathematicians have calculated that the number of connections which the human brain can carry exceeds the number of elementary particles in the universe. There's really no limit, but there is a limit. So what do we do with that? Okay. Realize this. That the primary element that's holding us back from learning, growing, changing is not our brain. Our brain is amazing. It's what we say to ourselves. Now, let's look at habits. Sarah created a pattern of a city. Our habits, ready, are created the exact same way. So, I have a habit of waking up at 3.30 in the morning. I do every single morning. I have been doing that for 30 years. Why? Because 30 years ago, I wrote my first book. It was a college textbook on computer software. The only time I could write was 3.30 in the morning. So, I'd wake up at 3.30 in the morning and write from 3.30 till 6. I did that for a year and a half until the book was published. Okay. When the book was published a year and a half later, I had created in my mind a habit of waking up at 3.30, just as Sarah had created in her mind a pattern of a city. And now that habit is so much a part of who I am that every day I wake up at 3.30, and a lot of times... I go for a run. Now, we have millions of habits. You have a pattern and habit for almost every single thing that you do. Okay. Now, let's talk about your habits. Number one, you can't get rid of them. They're wired into your brain. Even the bad habits. You cannot get rid of them unless you're willing to have a lobotomy, okay? Number two, habits are really, 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 really hard to change. They're really hard to change because somehow you have to get in there and disentangle them from all of the billions of connections down there. So they're really, really hard to change. Now, ready for this. If you can't get rid of them and they're really hard to change, here we go. Ready? You can replace them. Do you hear me? Yeah. You can replace them with new habits. Why do I use the word replace rather than change? Because when you tell the brain you're going to change something, it absolutely freaks out. It says, no, 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 no. My job is to keep you safe. My job is to keep you risk-free. And if you change something... That means that it's new and it didn't work last time, so it may not work this time. So let's just, let's just stay right where we're at and let's not change. So don't ever use the word change. But did you know that the brain hates change, but it loves to, ready, create things. It loves creating things. When Mary retired from teaching and principaling, 
Now she creates amazing, amazing things by knitting and crocheting. I'm the same way. I love creating little models and I love to write. Okay? So the love, the brain loves to create new things. So what do you do with habits? Okay. Let's talk about some habits or let's talk about some information about habits. How long does it create to how long does it take to create a habit? Usually you hear the word 21 days. That came from the work of Maxwell Maltz, who wrote Psycho, Psycho, Psycho Cybernetics. I won't go into his story, but he came up with the term 21 days that has since been questioned very heavily and habits take sometimes two days sometimes eight months it depends upon what you are creating in terms of a habit it can be very simple and it take a short time or it can be very very complicated okay but habits are almost everywhere. How you leave the house for work. What do you do when you get to work? So let's look at the habits that I have. Waking up at 3.30. Going for my run. Writing. Making breakfast with Mary. We have all these habits that we've created in our mind up here. They are hardwired into our brain, which means, again, you can't get rid of them, and they're really hard to change. But what you can do is you can replace them. How do you replace them? The best way to teach that is to give you a story, because stories make it real. Okay. So let me share with you a personal story that created a habit in me that I'm still using. My father died when he was very young. And as we drove away from the memorial service, Mary said to me, if you die early, I will kill you. Because I don't want to be a widow for 40 years. And I was about 40 pounds more than I weigh now. I said, okay, I need to lose this weight. So I would get up and run and swim, and I would lose maybe a two pounds in a week. But then on the weekend, I gained it all back. Why? Because I had developed habits of eating, and exercising, which was very minimal, and I gained all this weight. After 20 years of trying to lose the weight, I realized it isn't working. <coughs> so I began studying cognitive psychology and st stories of, I'm sorry, research on habits. And I realized that I need to start up here by seeing myself differently. Because here's what I would say to myself. Because this is a habit. I would say, you are a 240-pound man who's got to lose 40 pounds. When I said, you are a 240-pound man, do you know what my brain said? My brain said, okay, I believe you. Because I believe everything you tell me. So my job is to keep you at 240 pounds. Because that's how you see yourself. And that's what it did. And after 20 years of this, I said, this isn't working. It's not because I'm not exercising and doing all things. I somehow just get up in the middle of the night and eat. So I need to replace how I see myself. So I created what is called an affirmation. Affirmation is not new age. It's not weird. It's simply a statement that I made about myself. And the statement was something like, I look so great at 200 pounds because I love exercising and eating healthy. When I first said that, my brain freaked out. It said, no, 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 no. Don't do that. It's not true. It's not true. You're not 200 pounds. You're 240. And that's where I took charge. Here's an exciting characteristics of the brain you are in charge the brain listens to you so I said to my brain no I'm 200 pounds and I look great 
And after a couple of days, you know what my brain began to do? It began to rewire itself. To where instead of seeing myself at 240, I saw myself at 200. And you know what happened? The weight began coming off. And in one year, I was down to 200 pounds. Now, this is really important to understand. There is still a very, very, very strong habit in my brain of eating enough to bring me back to 240. But the <clears throat> new habit that I created at 200 pounds is what I lock onto. When my father was, when I was very young, my father taught me how to, taught me how to ride a bicycle. And took me out to this field to get the train was off. He said, now before I give you a shove, and don't worry, Steve, I'm going to be right next, next to you. You see that rock in the road about 50 feet? Yes, Daddy. Don't run into that rock. And you already know what happened. I got down on the bike, locked onto the rock so I would not run into it, and bam, right into the rock. That rock represents an affirmation. That's what I locked onto. So here's what I want to leave with people today. Whether it's smoking or drinking or eating incorrectly, those are habits that are wired into your brain. Those can be replaced. with something different. So let me give you another story. My wife smoked for the first 10 years of our marriage and years and years before that. And she would say every January, okay, honey, this is the year, this is the year, this is the year, I'm gonna stop smoking. And she would last for a week or a month and then she'd go back. Why? Because she had a habit up here, which is also called the self-image of a smoker. And her brain would say, if you're a smoker, why are you not smoking? And she couldn't argue against that. And she began smoking again. Then, 10 years after this, she flew home to watch her father die of emphysema. And I picked her up at SFO, San Francisco Airport. She looked at me as we drove home and she said, you are looking at a non-smoker and she has a smoke sense she could but she doesn't and here's the exciting part every single time she doesn't the brain rewires itself a little bit more so that she is a non-smoker it starts with what we are saying to ourselves about ourselves now what's so exciting is that I now eat very little and I'm already losing some more weight. Why? Because I've created a new self-image of being 190 pounds because that's where I want to be. So let's go back to what I want to begin in the beginning. You are in charge. Your brain listens to you. And when you say something, your brain says, okay, I believe you. And you lock onto it and your brain rewires itself so that new habits are created. Is it easy? Of course not. Because some of the habits we've had all of our lives, some of the habits are the way we look at ourselves. Some of the habits are what we say to ourselves about ourselves. But we can replace that. Let me share with you one last story and then we'll close. I had the habit of 42 years of saying to myself, I'm really stupid. That was a habit I developed when I was two years old. I'm really dumb. I'm really stupid. I can't do anything. I'm really bad with numbers. But then when I was about 40 years old, I discovered computers back in the 1970s. And I found myself tinkering around. And I enjoyed it so much it got to be fun. Then I went back to school. 
and I got a graduate degree in computer science. And I discovered, lo and behold, that I'm not stupid. I'm really smart. And I began teaching classes at universities. And one day the dean came to the office. He said, one of our math professors just quit, Steve. So you are our new math professor. <clears throat> Wait a minute. I can't do math. I can't do numbers. You said, you want a job? Learn. There's the book. Next semester. So I ran down to the library. And I picked up all the books I could on brain-based learning and how the brain learned. That's how this whole thing started. And I began teaching math based on how the brain learns. And students began saying, oh, you are such a good math teacher. And you know what I began doing? I began listening to those students rather than what I've been saying to myself for 42 years. I replaced the self-talk with talk that said, I'm really smart at this. I ended up writing two college textbooks, and what do you think? Computer software and math. So here's the point I want to make with your listeners. You are in control. Your brain listens to you. And when there are habits in your life that you just don't like, which we all have, rather than trying to change them, replace them. Create a new habit. Lock on to it. Is it hard at first? Of course it is. The brain hates change. But over time, when you lock on to that new habit, it becomes a part of the way you think. It becomes a part of your mindset. And then over time, ready? Here we go. It becomes a part of who you are. That's exciting. That is exciting. Wow. Mm. That is exciting. So I, 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 have is... to I have to tell you, though, that um, a year ago we didn't know you, but you are now a habit. <laughs> and, and I didn't. And I didn't. I didn't have to do affirmations or anything else. I just had to listen to you. Okay, it's a good you, make habit. So, you make so much sense. It, it's a good habit, and I'm not. I'm. I'm not changing it. Thank you. <laughs> it's interesting. People say, "Why are you such a great speaker?" Because I am, and I say because I have been giving the same presentation thousands of times all over the your, the world for 12 years. You do the same thing over and over and over. You get really good at it. Nothing magical about that. You just get really good at it. I just love the concept that you can create a new habit yeah. to replace the old habit. Yeah. Is it hard? Yes, it is. Yeah. Because some of the habits we've had all of our lives. Sure. And that's even the destructive habits. We have destructive habits that we, I mean, we shoot ourselves in the foot. We live in a broken world and we're a broken people. Yeah. But. Well, as you said, as you said, the brain doesn't ask. That's right. Is it good or bad? Should I or shouldn't I? It just says, if you say so. Okay. 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 Yeah. Say. okay. Yeah. yeah. Terrific stuff. Thank you. I know it is. It is really terrific stuff. Good. Uh, well, that's we'll why I love teaching it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.